sort of visiting the warehouse of terrorists, or uh, uh, you can you can uh, uh, enrich that idea by reviewing previous literatures and the like. After you review the literature, you will go for formulating a research hypothesis. Now you identified the research variables. The relationship of those variables will be uh, uh, constructed in a meaningful way. That is what uh, formulation of hypothesis is. Once you have all these concepts, then you will start thinking about the entire process of research design, that is. In uh, this, you could uh, uh, think about the methodology. You, took, you, you, you also think about data collection, the sampling methods, the sampling techniques, the uh, sampling frames that you are going to focus and the like. After this, you will go for the execution stage, which is data collection, uh, based on the plans that you made in uh, research design, you will go for data collection. And unless your data is good, it's, it's uh, very difficult to come up with a conclusion which is sound for organizations and maybe for academicians. Uh, so uh, you have to be sure that uh, the data collected is nice, the data collected is up to the requirement, it fits with the research design that you have uh, made earlier. Then finally, if you have a uh, hypothesis, you will go for testing it, you analyze the finding, the data, and finally you will see the implication of the finding, that is the interpretation. This is the overall uh, conceptual framework of research undertaking, but my, my, my uh, focus today will be on sampling and data collection, which is very tiny, very minor part of research undertaking. But uh, when we are uh, thinking about conducting a research, whatever the type of research it may be, we have to have at least the full picture, right from step one, up to the last step, which is writing a conclusion or writing interpretation or uh, uh, whatever the naming suggestion uh, you may also say. But the entire process has to be in your mind prior to starting conducting a research. So uh, when we are talking about sampling, that is uh, the, the, the basic uh, topic of today's talk. Uh, uh, we uh, also want to know the population because when we are saying sampling, there has to be population. Population is uh, a set which includes all measurements of interest from which uh, the sample will be drawn. If uh, the picture that I put here is visible, the big picture, the big circle is uh, uh, the population, and from that population, depending on different techniques, I will come to that later, uh, you could take some manageable member of the population, we call it sample, and sample is in any way less than the population. That that's why we are saying sample is a subset of the population. Due to different reasons, we may not be able to go for census. In that case, we may be forced to use uh, sample, then sample is uh, a subset, sometimes a proper subset uh, of a population that is less in number when we compare it to the population. Uh, another terminology that can uh, think of is uh, the target population, the sample frame, and sampling unit. The target population is a population to which we want to generalize. For example, if we, if we want to say uh, bankers or community in a certain a certain uh, area, we could collect data taking uh, samples from that that community. But finally, we will speak about the, the entire population. That is what target population is. The population to which we will generalize finally. But the, st the starting point, the initial point, will be uh, sample. Sampling frame is list of all sample units from which sample is to be drawn. The sample unit is, uh, if we are think of a household, 
every household member uh, could be considered in this case. So sampling unit is the smallest unit from which sample can be selected. The sampling scheme is that is the method, the method of selecting sample unit. Uh, we will come to that later on. So uh, from uh, if we look at hierarchically, we have population, we will bring it down into target population to which we are going to generalize. Then we will put sample frame. From sample frame, we put again sampling unit. From sampling unit, we will pick uh, persons or company or any variable that we want so that we will be taking it into uh, our data uh, collection. Uh, another question that might uh, come into everyone's mind when uh, you are starting uh, to conduct a research is why for sampling? Uh, because there is saying that the higher uh, the sample size or the higher uh, the units that we are taking, the higher the precision will be. Because when we are taking sampling, we are assuming that the statistics Sample statistics, I mean, are uh, going to predict the population parameter. We are going to generalize the sample from small things to the big thing. But what if, if we are taking census rather than sampling? But uh, in this case, uh, it, it may be totally impossible, especially when the population is large enough, which is not manageable in size. So uh, some of the reasons uh, that we are going to use uh, as an excuse to go for sampling is less cost. We can enjoy the cost reduction. If uh, we are trying to uh, go for census, the cost will be too much. That could be uh, unmanageable. And sometimes to collect data from the entire population, it may take 10 years, 15 years, five years, which is uh, in this volatile world, in this dynamism, is not tolerable as far as the research is concerned. So you better focus on a, a certain group. We try to collect representative data and generalize about the population. So less field time, less energy, less effort will be required when you are comparing it with uh, the census. Another is more accuracy. It seems odd, actually. More accuracy. Which one is more accuracy? Taking census or uh, taking sample. Uh, I argue that taking sample will be much more accurate. You, you can come up with, because you will dig into it. If you are trying to spare yourself into thousand, you cannot reach. You cannot be uh, everywhere at a time. But if, if you are focusing on a certain area, a certain variable, then uh, you can. But the, the good thing here is you have to be sure that the sample that you are taking is representative. As far as you are taking representative sample, uh, more accuracy will be generated because more or less your sample can predict the characteristic of the characteristic of uh, uh, your sample can predict the characteristic of the population that is still. Uh, uh, huge in number. So in that case, more accuracy could be uh, obtained uh, as a result of using sampling our uh, census. Another one is when it is impossible to study the whole population. Uh, it's clear by itself. So when it is impossible, the possibility could be through sampling. Uh, so uh, in these days, uh, it's not uh, questionable to go for sampling rather than uh, census. If they are manageable, you, you, you could go, but most of the time, uh, especially if you are going for uh, basic research, if you are trying to conduct a basic research that will contribute to the knowledge gap or the theoretical gap that is existed, then uh, sampling is important because uh, you cannot spare yourself into many issues, rather uh, you could be advised to focus on uh, certain areas so that generalization could be possible in that way. Uh, type of sampling, uh, actually as far as, as far as the kind of uh, sampling is concerned, we have uh, basically two categories. One is non-probability sampling, especially if you want to go for a qualitative type of study, 
but you cannot generalize. One, one thing uh, everyone should bear in mind is uh, if you take non-probability sampling uh, one way or the other way, that's the researchers best could be inevitable in this case. So for qualitative research, you can go for non-probability sampling, but if you want it to be quantitative, for quantitative research methodologies, probability sampling is uh, usually preferred. Uh, non-probability sampling could be uh, like this. Uh, the first could be convenient. This is based on the, the, the ease of accessing data. For example, I try to collect data. Uh, I have, uh, uh, we have conducted a research on commercial bank financing to micro, small and medium enterprises in the case of uh, Dakshina Canada and ODP. Then uh, we, we, we select two banks and uh, respondents to. We try to, we, we distributed questionnaire, but on a convenience way. Because I'm a foreigner, I cannot uh, name everyone who is uh, getting access from the bank. Uh, I cannot uh, mention every MSME owners or MSME uh, managers. What I choose is going for convenience. Based on my convenience, I approach them. Uh, then I try to collect data, but uh, basically it's not possible to generalize about the entire population because the representation will be questionable in this case. Another one is snowball, friends of friends. I may ask Mr. X uh, uh, on a certain issue, whom I believe he knows well. Then I will ask an, uh, if he knew another person as well, I will follow the same. That is the snowball sampling technique, uh, which is non-probability sampling. The other is purposive, based on the purpose of uh, your research. Uh, we could uh, try to approach uh, Sample units, for example, if you want to study uh, turnover intention in your college, let's say, then uh, the target population in this case will be those who are already employed in your college, because you are going to ask them the intention, whether they are intended to leave, if they have intention to leave the college or not. If they are unemployed, that's out of the domain automatically. So based on the purpose, you can collect data and this is a still non-probability sampling. Quota sampling, based on the quota, you, you can put a certain quota for a certain, a certain vicinity or a certain group. For example, you could say uh, uh, districts in uh, Karnataka state, and for uh, Dakshina Canada, you may put a certain quota, for Udupi, you may put a certain quota, for another area, some, you, you may put a certain quota in the lack. So it is non-probability sampling. Uh, there are researchers who assume that it is near to uh, proportionate stratified random sampling. But, but uh, for the time being, we have to uh, focus on this. Is quota sampling is non-probability sampling. Uh, you could put uh, or you could uh, collect or you could uh, determine the sample based on the quota for a certain group of people, a certain group of organization, or any measurement unit that you want to have. Uh, Non-probability sampling is, uh, many uh, claim that this is cheaper, uh, but uh, the basic thing is uh, there is possibility of bias. Researchers, bias could be there. Uh, like what I have said, based on the convenience, I don't want to exert too much effort. So I prefer a convenience. The, the, the bad thing again is, if I try to generalize, that will be another issue. So it's, there is potential for bias, but as far as the cost is concerned, this is the cheaper one, which is non-probability sampling. The probability sampling, in this case, each subject has a known probability of being selected. It allows application of statistical sample theory to result to generalize and test hypothesis. Uh, if you want to test the hypothesis, uh, there is no question that probability sampling technique has to be employed. Because if you want to test the hypothesis, you are going to generalize. For generalization, based on uh, the sample statistics you, you obtain, 
you are going to predict for the entire population, I mean, for the target population. In that case, uh, it's, it's must to use probability sampling. What are uh, these probability sampling methods? Uh, I'll go uh, into, in, in brief, actually, uh, for methods. The first is simple random sampling technique or method. The second is systematic sampling. The third is uh, stratified sampling. The fourth is uh, multi-state sampling. In simple random sampling, uh, usually if you refer most of uh, the tests conducted, mo most of the uh, uh, MCOM or MBA uh, reporters produced, they may say, uh, I have used random sampling, but in reality that is not random sampling. So when we are saying ra simple random or random sampling, we have to be sure that we randomly selected sample from the given population. It's not haphazard sampling. If I, I take randomly from uh, persons who are found here, uh, that's not random sampling technique as far as research uh, prob probability uh, uh, sampling technique or as far as simple random sampling technique is concerned. We have to have random numbers. We can produce ourselves in a spreadsheet, or we can take this random number from random number tables. I will show you the steps that uh, we have to follow when we are uh, using simple random sampling, but uh, we should not uh, collect data on the half that way. Uh, Mr. X here, Mr. Y, ran that's, not, that's not random sampling technique. We have to put everyone, we have to list everyone, we have to assign number, we have to use random number, then based on the random number, we can pick. The second, another one systematic, that is a case unit sampling. You have the population, you have sample size that you determine, then you divide the population into sample size, you arrange the population, that is a target population, and based on the, the, the gap, the tenth number could be selected, the fifth number could be selected, or the like. The third one is stratified sampling. Uh, sometimes we could divide the population into cluster or strata, uh, but the population uh, that are grouped together are assumed to be homogeneous. Previously, heterogeneous uh, population will be divided into uh, homogeneous subgroup. Then once we divide the population into cluster or strata, uh, finally, we could apply simple random sampling technique or you can use even a systematic uh, sampling technique. The multi-state sampling, this is uh, geographic most of the time. We can go for uh, uh, country, for example, India. Then you will come down to state, Karnataka state. Then you will come to division, if that is so. I mean, I should you could say. Then you could come to district. Then from district, you could come to taluk, then uh, to uh, household level. In that case, the multi-state, the states are multi. You, the, the intention of sampling is to reduce uh, the number of uh, population to be drawn as a sample meaning manager. In that way, you can uh, come into the household level. We call it multi-state sampling. Uh, creating a simple random sample, uh, six steps are there. The first, you need to define the population, that is a target population. The, the second is uh, choose your sample size. Uh, the sample size could be calculated based on the formula, which I will uh, uh, show you later on. Step three, list the population. We can list the entire, uh, the entire population exhaustively, that is the target population, I mean. You assign number to the unit, then find random number. You can find it from random tables, or you can create your own uh, random number with a spreadsheet. I will show you now. Then select your sample. The second, the third, the fourth, you can choose. And finally, it has to be similar to the sample size that you determine. For example, let me show you here. If it is visible, I hope it will be. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is how you can, you, you can open a spreadsheet, you say uh, equal, you, you just uh, press equal, then write around between, around between, then open the bracket, one, 
comma 100. Now you are asking the spreadsheet to give you random numbers that are between 1 and 100. If your population is 100 and if you want to take 10 samples from that, you can use. So you can name the employees or whatever variable you want, then the first variable, the second variable, the third variable will be taken. Those names were assigned to the, the second, the first, the 44th, 85, 18, 49, 10, 42, 39, 19, these are going to be sampled. Based on random number, you can collect, you can use simple random sampling technique and come up with a sample. Uh, another one is systematic sampling technique. This is example. Uh, I tried to explain it earlier. Uh, the first the, the three steps are there. One is assign number to every element in your population. Uh, this is especially possible when uh, the populations are known. The second one is decide how large your sample size should be. Uh, the third one is divide the population by your sample. Uh, for example, let's assume our population is 1 lakh, which is 100,000. Our sample size is 400. Then the, the, the difference that we want to consider, the case value has to be sampled. Then to determine K, 100,000 divided by uh, 400, it will be 250. The first person to be chosen will be the 250 uh, person. Then the second will be the uh, 500 500th person. The third, it will continue uh, that way. This is systematic sampling technique based on uh, the convenience. I mean, from uh, uh, the probability sampling technique, you can use stratified uh, sampling, the population was huge, then we, do, we bring them into cluster, then cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, from cluster one, you could again apply uh, simple random sampling technique or systematic uh, uh, sampling technique, whatever the convenience it could be, you can go for that. Once we divide the population into cluster or strata, we are assuming that uh, homogeneity will be there. The previously heterogeneous uh, population will be uh, segregated into smaller groups, relatively homogeneous. From those homogeneous, you can pick uh, anybody with, with a probability uh, so that we can come up with the number which is manageable uh, in size. Uh, Multi-state sampling, that, like uh, what I have said, uh, also known as multi-stage cluster sampling because we are clustering here also. During this sampling method, significant cluster of the selected people are split into subgroups at various stages to make it simple for primary data collection. You can have uh, even continent or you can have a subcontinent, whatever it may be, but here let's focus on country, let's say India, then the state, Karnataka, then division. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Previously, I, did, I read uh, when I when, uh, 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 written material that is my it size. Then district, you can say Udupi. Then you can uh, name your taluk. Then you can come up at uh, a certain level, uh, at household level. Even from the household, you may focus depending on uh, your your. Uh, uh, intention to, to go how detailed. Uh, the problem that we usually face when you are uh, sampling is it's not free from error. But as much as possible, we have to reduce the error. But committing error may be inevitable sometimes. The question here is, are errors uh, tolerable? I mean, uh, you could commit error, but if it is within acceptable range, you can ignore that. But if it is beyond that, the entire research finding could be discarded. So that you have to take maximum care when you are taking sample, especially if you are uh, uh, trying to generalize the population based on the samples that you collect, the level of errors should be reduced. Here, uh, we can have uh, sampling error, or we can have systematic error. Systematic error, you can have bias, inaccurate response, 
uh, in this case, a, research, a researcher's dilemma could be uh, existed. Uh, you yourself know what is going on, but you have to collect data in a formal way. If the respondent is giving you information which is inaccurate, uh, that's very difficult. So you have to take maximum care so that, so that uh, the person will give you accurate information which cannot uh, lead your finding into uh, that. In this case, especially in social science, in some uh, sensitive variables, people uh, may not tell you uh, they intend to tell. In that case, you have to be smart enough so that uh, uh, you should not approach them in person. Especially if you know them well, they may not want to expose themselves into a researcher under protection so that uh, they prefer to lie. Uh, so uh, to avoid such uh, a problem, such a bias, such, such inaccurate or misinformation, you can you can uh, give them chance so that everyone puts uh, the response of the questioner in a certain box in a different area so that he can put uh, the response anytime uh, he wants uh, invisibly. In that case, you can at least reduce uh, the bias. The bias could be uh, resulted from researchers, but as a researcher, we need to be, I mean, uh, a researcher is not supposed to be biased. Uh, sometimes he or she may commit errors, but that has to be, that has to be corrected. Another one is selection bias, sample selection bias, whatever it may be, but it is at our hands so that we can, we can uh, solve this problem. The second is sampling error, random sampling error, random error we, we will support. Uh, mostly type 1 and type 2 error. This is the name. Uh, usually errors, uh, sampling errors are known. Sometimes uh, we erroneously reject hypothesis. Sometimes we erroneously accept the hypothesis. In this case, uh, you might hear that there is false positive, there is false negative as far as coronavirus test is concerned. I've been reading one article uh, about U US uh, test system and it was saying like that, it may be due to the, 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 the equipment problem or it may be due to different reasons, the software problem, maybe. But uh, my focus is not that. We may reject the hypothesis which we should accept. We may accept the hypothesis uh, which we should reject. In that case, error one, uh, I mean type one error, type two error could be there. Type one error, for example, is the probability of finding a difference with our sample compared to the population. And the reality is not one. You see, there may not be a difference at all. The, the, the sample that we collect can speak, can predict about the population that we have. There is no difference at all, but erroneously, we may, we may take it, uh, there is a difference. In that case, we are committing type 1 error, but for that, we have to give the tolerable limit. 5% uh, is acceptable in this case. Sometimes in social science, it may go up to 10%, but in natural science, they are too much sensitive, especially in health matters. They are too much sensitive, and most of the time they are putting it 99% precision. That means 1% type 1 error is accepted in that case. But in our case, in management and uh, commerce research, 5% is tolerable. We can have 5%. If it is beyond 5%, uh, we, we could caution. The second error is type 2 error. This is the probability of not finding a difference. The difference is existed, but we may not realize that. The probability of not finding a difference that actually exists between our sample compared to the population. There is difference, but we are not finding it. We erroneously accept the hypothesis. In fact, we should reject that hypothesis. In this case, uh, it is type 2 error again. Uh, type 2 error is a statistical term referring to acceptance or non-rejection of the false null hypothesis. Uh, we can also have uh, some say 80% uh, has to be the power. That means 20% is uh, acceptable like that. Uh, now let's come to sample size. Uh, actually, sample size 
it, it depends on the type of population we have. Therefore, uh, 100 sample could be representative, 500 sample size may not be representative. So to say a sample size is sufficient, uh, we have to know the characteristic of the population that we have. The population characteristic has to be known in this case. Uh, but uh, to, 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 to be free from all these things, uh, we could use a formula uh, considering uh, the population and acceptable error term and the like. But let, let's see at least three points that we should focus uh, before we determine the sample size. The first one is the variability, how our population is heterogeneous. If the population is heterogeneous, uh, as much as possible, we have to increase the number of uh, uh, sample size. I mean, the size of the sample has to be increased because uh, people are different, they have different uh, uh, whatever the variable we want, culture, whatever, whatever. So to get a representation, I mean, if we want to generalize, at least we have to uh, get a larger sample size. The second one is know how precise the population statistics need to be. If we, uh, precise, if we want to uh, predict uh, the population uh, parameter precisely from the sample statistics, Again, the sample size is better to be uh, large in this case. Know exactly, the third one is know exactly how confident you must be in a result. Uh, you may say, I'm 100% confident. If you want to be 100% confident, the sample size has to be uh, uh, large. And, or you may, you, you may be required to go for census rather than sampling because 100% confidence in the research is very, very, very difficult. You may say 95% I'm confident enough the sample statistics can predict the population parameter. You may say in that way. So the, the, the higher the confidence you want to have, the, the higher the sample size uh, could be. But for simplicity, we can use a measurement or a formula to come up with a certain sample size. For example, uh, this one is n, small n is equal to large n, that is population divided by uh, within the bracket one plus population multiplied by error term uh, raised to. This is the formula for sample size given by uh, Slovin. Uh, he was a researcher and uh, he came up with this formula. At least he appreciates the error, then he bought it. Uh, this is usually, you can find uh, this, or you can use any, any, any uh, formula, but uh, more or less you have to be sure that the sample size that you are taking is representative. I mean, you can, you, you can uh, infer uh, about the population from uh, the samples that you, that you consider. Uh, when you are uh, talking about uh, sample size, two things has to be balanced. One is a precision, another is a cost, effort, and everything. We can, we can uh, put all of them in a cost category. If you want to, uh, increase the precision, you have to collect many data, you have to exact effort, you have to increase the sample size. Uh, in this case, the cost will come up. If you want to uh, reduce the cost, your precision will be affected. So as much as possible, the balance, the beam balance has to be maintained between the precision and the cost. You should not suppress the cost or you should not, uh, on, on, on the expense of the precision or you, could, you should not bring the cost down uh, by tolerating the precision that you want to have. So it is to be balanced always. Uh, now let's come to the second, uh, which is data collection. Once we uh, uh, put the sample size, uh, once we uh, put the technique of sampling, once we do, uh, all these things, the next is execution, that is collecting the real data. And uh, when you are thinking of collecting the real data, uh, I think it's better to know the type of data, the data that you are going to collect, because it will affect your analysis. If you want to uh, collect a qualitative data that will be good as far as designing a questionnaire, as far as designing 
uh, interview questions and the like is concerned. But when you come to analysis, you will pay. You will pay. So before you start collecting data, you have to always think about the statistical tools that you are going to use, the analysis techniques that you are going to use, the, method, the methodology, the method of interpretation that you are going to apply so that you can adjust ahead of time. Anyways, once the sample is determined, once the sample element is known, the next step will be uh, data collection. And we can collect data in different ways. We can have source of data, uh, either primary data or secondary data. We can get it from anywhere, depending on the purpose, type, uh, and the like of research that you want to have. You can have interview. You can have data from uh, secondary materials, from books, journals, whatever it may be, from reports of a company. You can have your own observation. Sometimes you can distribute uh, uh, sample structured questionnaires. You can distribute, then uh, you can collect the questionnaire and you start to analyze. You can also have focus group discussion. Usually media people use this. They bring experts together, then they will take a moderating role, then uh, they will come up with a certain analysis result at the end. Anyway, you can use any of the techniques that uh, fits uh, to your, your research. Um, in statistics, you could have data, you could have information. Our intention of collecting data is not to report it as it is, but to change it into information. That is a process data, which is an input for decision making. If we want the data that can be used for decision making for managers or whoever he may be, then we have to be sure that the data is quality data. That fits with quality in a sense, a data that fits with the purpose. So three questions has to be raised in this case. Where does data come from? That is a sampling. Was our sampling technique right? Was our sampling uh, procedures uh, firmly followed? Uh, were we wrong during sampling? If there was something wrong, then we have to correct it back. Because everywhere it is interrelated. The process of research right from problem uh, definition up to interpretation, it is interrelated. If something go wrong, in either of the process, then it will definitely affect the, the quality of your research. So every time, a monitoring has to be taken. And as far as the data is concerned, the first question that we need to ask is, where does data come from? Will it represent? Is it genuinely selected? If Mr. Y is selected, then what is the best to choose Mr. Y? Is that like uh, a magic number or a magic person? Or is that because of his tallness? Because of his, all these things has to be uh, addressed. But uh, if you want to generalize, if you want to change your data into information that can be used as an input for decision making, then you have to be sure that uh, at least probability sampling techniques have been in place. The second question that you can address, you can ask is how it was gathered. That is the technicality. The technicality. Sometimes, like uh, you, you could raise very sensitive questions, but uh, rather than saying, no, I'm not happy to answer your question, uh, people may accept your questionnaire and simply tick. In that case, it will spoil the entire process that you have been uh, exerting your research. So the technique, uh, how you are collecting that data has to be uh, taken into consideration again. The third one is, how do we ensure this accuracy? The reliability and validity. Sometimes, especially when, uh, for example, if we want to collect data through questionnaire, then before we have uh, uh, real data collection, we can give it. The draft can be given to someone who is an expertise in the area so that the uh, content validity could be checked. No, this is vague. You should, you should avoid so-and-so words. You should uh, reframe the sentence in this case. Something like that can be taken. Once you get approval from, from the expert again, you will go into a very small 
uh, pilot study. Like 15, 20 samples can be taken. Uh, you may include those or may not include those in later uh, data collection. Then you can see if there is misunderstanding between your intention or what you want to collect and what actually uh, collected. If there is discrepancy, then you can think of reframing the questions that you want. So how do we ensure its accuracy? The reliability and validity of the tools that you are using is very important again. So you can you can address these questions, and in this way, uh, you can you can uh, collect the data that qualifies that fits to the purpose. Another one is uh, method of data collection. Actually, uh, you can have direct observation, as I tried to uh, say it in the form of picture. You can have direct observation. You can have experiment. It is rare in uh, social science, actually, but there is a still. There is an experiment, it does not necessarily uh, mean in a laboratory like what uh, chemists, physics, whatever are doing. We can do experiment in social science too, but the ethical consideration has to be seriously taken. Uh, usually it's not customary in our case. Personal interview, you can uh, collect data, you can arrange personal interview, you can uh, frame uh, interview questions, and uh, you can uh, sometimes probe uh, probing question could be, uh, or on the spot question could be raised for your interview. Telephone interview, you can do uh, mail questionnaire, you can distribute these days. Social media is a good platform. Uh, you should not knock everyone's door. Then you can uh, send, you can prepare uh, your questionnaire through Google Doc. Then you can distribute it to uh, a group of uh, social media uh, users. Then they can uh, uh, respond it so that you can collect uh, the data in this way. Most of the time, self-administered questionnaires are uh, importantly used, but it does not mean these are the only uh, tools that we are using. Uh, when uh, we are using self-administered questions, there are governing principles. Uh, if we are following them, it would be good, but uh, necessarily, uh, it may, you, you may not pick everything written here, but uh, more or less it will be unimportant for you to develop a questionnaire if, we are, if we are, you are following this questionnaire designing principles uh, seriously. The first one is keep the questionnaire as short as possible. It is to be expressed in a simple word. It should not be uh, vague to respondent. If the person found your questionnaire back or your question back, two options will be there. One, it will be remained open, then no response at all, or wrong answer could be given to you, which will distort your research. Ask short, simple, and clearly worded questions. Wordiness has to be avoided from your questionnaire. Start with demography questions. Yeah, usually it is happening, but you have to be serious. And I mean, you have to be careful when you are asking demography questions like uh, income, uh, like age. Some people are age sensitive. They don't want to tell you the exact age they have. In this case, you can, you can be smart so that you can put the range between 25 up to 35, or between 20 to 25. In that case, they can comfortably give. If uh, the culture dictates otherwise, you can ask them to put a specific age uh, like 35, 20, 25, something like that. But you have to be careful. You have to know the common understanding as far as demographic variables is concerned. But as a matter of sequence, most of the time, demographic variables come first and the complexity, I mean, the, the conceptual, uh, the, con the concepts that carry, the questions that carry much uh, strong concepts will come at the uh, it has its own uh, limitation as well because uh, the person may get tired uh, before reaching the, the, the last question. Then uh, he may uh, start filling uh, the question without even reading it properly. Use dichotomous uh, yes or no question and multiple choice question. You can also use scale like a Likert scale, seven, five scale, nine scale sometimes, 11 scale, it depends on, but there is no relation at all. Uh, different articles are telling us whether you are using uh, 
three, uh, seven, uh, nine, it doesn't matter, but you have to seriously uh, follow uh, the procedure, what uh, that liquor just can me. Use open-ended questions. Sometimes you can, you can, you can uh, give them a chance to say what they uh, think about the concepts that you are searching. Avoid using leading questions. Uh, this is a serious problem, by the way, when you are uh, drafting a questionnaire or when you are asking uh, your interviewee, an interview question, for example, if your, your uh, title is uh, to know turnover or the effect of turnover, and if you are asking the interviewer, most of uh, the person, most of uh, the, the, the staff here are uh, in a way to leave the institution. What do you think? Are you going to stay here? Or if you are asking such a leading question, uh, there is a high possibility that the person will say you, no, I'm also not staying here. I will be living with my friends, he may say. So don't ask a leading question because it will give you uh, a distorted response so that your entire uh, research finding will be spoiled. Pretest a questionnaire on a small number of uh, people, that is a pilot sampling technique, Think about the way. The most important thing is when you are drafting, when you are designing a questionnaire that is dis to be distributed, you have to think about the technique of analyzing your questionnaire. Sometimes you may collect data when you are uh, feeding your data into a software, it may not fit to the model that you uh, prehab, that you specified earlier. In this case, you may be forced to, to discard your data and start from the scratch. So, the, the, the type of uh, questionnaire, the type of data, the type of variable you want to uh, include has to be seriously concerned. And when you are doing all these things, you have to think about the interpretation, you have to think about the analysis and the like. Because the entire research process is interlinked. Uh, uh, I come to know that most of uh, the participants in the session are uh, secondary MUCOM students, and uh, they could be uh, requested to, to write a research proposal. Uh, so I want to focus here on uh, parts of research proposal. Uh, but in research, one important thing is uh, it depends on uh, the perspective that you want to see in which respect, in whatever perspective you are in, uh, these are usually usually uh, parts of research proposal uh, that are to be included in your research. The first one is background of the study. If you are uh, conducting a research about uh, a certain company as a case study, you can bring one point one could be background of the organization, unless. If you are writing uh, a, ba a basic research, then the background of the study will be the historical background of the subject matter that you want to study about. So theories could be visited. Uh, previous, uh, previously existing literatures could be literature could be consulted and the like. The second one is statement of the problem. What motivates you to conduct this research? What real gap? Did you identify? For example, if you if you want to study cause and effect of turnover in your organization, then you have to have a convincing problem at your hand. Turnover is high, the organization could be affected. Then you need to show how uh, the problem is really tangible in your company. In that case, statement of the problem can be uh, taken. Or if you are conducting uh, basic research again, the gap the knowledge gap, the theoretical, the theoretical gap should be clearly uh, identified, especially if you want to publish an article. Uh, the first thing reviewers and editors will know, will start reading will be the novelty of your research. And that novelty will be uh, explained in a good way, articulated in a good way at your statement of the problem. The third one is objective of the study. You could have uh, five or six depending on uh, your interest, specific objectives, and most of the time, one general objective, which is related to your title or related to your problem, problem could be there. Research methodology is the fourth part. In this 
sampling and data collection techniques, sampling techniques, source of data, population and sample size, sample size determination formula, data processing and statistical tool, all these things could be incorporated in a research methodology. The fifth one is significance of the study. What is the significance? What is, you have to show the significance of the study so that the reader will be convinced Oh, this research is significant to the organization, to the employer, to the government, wherever it may be. Then limitation. Actually, it's, it's, it's obvious that every research has limitation. Let alone others, taking sample by itself is a limitation because we don't have time and energy to reach everyone in a population because we don't have uh, money because of the cost issue. Uh, we cannot reach everyone in a population. So limitation will be there, that's one thing. Geographical uh, scope could be stated in the scope of the study. Usually limitation and scope of the study will come together. Then 6.1, limitation, 6.2, scope of the study you can state. If you are organizing your report, your thesis, uh, in a compiled way, then chapter scheme could be taken into consideration. Chapterization, chapter one, introduction, chapter two, literature, it depends on your guide actually. Your, your mentor will tell you uh, how to do as far as uh, the research procedure is concerned because uh, different uh, researchers will have different perspectives, different editors of journals, different reviewers of journals will have their own perspective, so it depends on the perspective. Always it's better to follow what the institutions want you to follow. If your college is dictating you to follow this procedure, that is the better way to follow. But generally, uh, these are uh, the procedures that could be taken into consideration when you are writing a research proposal or when you are writing a thesis or a report, MCOM, MBA, whatever it may be. Uh, the, the next to objective of the study, you could have hypothesis of the study, but uh, this is an optional. You can uh, design your hypothesis if you want to test it. If you are not going to test your hypothesis, you should not, you should never incorporate it. If your sampling technique is probably, probability sampling technique, then you should not go for hypothesis testing because hypothesis has to be tested quantitatively and the sample that you are going to use has to be population representative. You are going to infer based on the, the, the hypothesis test result, you are going to infer about the population. That is only possible if you are uh, using quantitative data and if you prefer that you can also include unless you can uh, leave it and use research questions in place. Having all this, uh, what will be the benefit? After uh, collecting data, after conducting research, ultimately we have to go for publishing our article, our research finding in reputable uh, journals. What is the benefit? What is the importance of uh, conducting research after all? Okay, as a, a company manager, you could solve your problem, which is at your hand, that is your mandate. But as academician, as MCOM student, as uh, MBA student, what is the, the, the requirement? Uh, what, is, what is the benefit of uh, publishing an article in a reputable journal? Uh, it could be related to prestige. Uh, if you are publishing in a renowned journal, uh, different uh, persons and institutions may like to connect and collaborate with you. Uh, that will again uh, enhance your profile recognition, that's like uh, the previous one. Uh, greater good, sometimes when you are conducting, especially when you are uh, doing uh, basic research, you are contributing to your profession. You are adding something to your, your profession. So you are a global citizen now. Uh, when you are writing an academic paper and if it is published in a reputable journal, different people, your article will have effect in so many uh, areas because of the findings that you have. That is the nobility. Remuneration sometimes, you could be financially remunerated. Financial incentive could be related to the, the publications that you have or because you are conducting a research, finance could be given to you in the form of project or whatever it may be. 
another is a requirement to say employed in the industry. Uh, for example, in my case, in my institution, which is in uh, Addis Ababa University, a new legislation uh, is enacted last year, 2019, and it says if you want to stay in the institution as an academia, you have to publish one article every year. If you are not publishing, previously, you know, publish or perish. Now that thing is changed. Publish or perish is changed to publish and perish. Your publication has to be cited again. Your publication has to be in a reputable journal again. You remember the, the year before, the, the requirement in the uh, Indian journals. Because uh, the measurement from uh, UGC, University Grant Commission, is changed now. Previously, uh, uh, in UGC journals are not now in UGC careless journals. The future will be much more tough, I think. So if you want to stay in academic environment, it may be a requirement one way or another way. For example, in my institution, I'm telling you that if I'm not publishing, I have to change the industry. I have to go somewhere else. Uh, which could I fit to. But academic environment may not tolerate anymore if you are not publishing. Uh, this could be some of the benefit that uh, you can get in uh, publishing your article in a reputable journal. This is uh, all. Uh, we can have uh, questions. I mean, we accept questions. Thank you very much. I hope everyone was listening. Thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge, and you have enlightened all of us. We assure you that we will write some research papers in the days to come. Thank you, sir. Now, the session is open for discussion. Participants can clarify their doubts with sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is Abhinandan from Mangalore University. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, I have one question, sir. Okay. Sir, does uh, sample selection or uh, the selection of sampling technique affect uh, the analysis part? Okay. Does it affect? Uh, because if I select the probability sampling technique, uh, whether there is uh, some condition that I have to choose a, a selected uh, statistical tools? Is there any rule, sir? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. Any question, please? Shall I, shall I address this question, then uh, proceed to the next? Sir, you can proceed. OK. Uh, I'm audible now? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Aminata, for the question you raised. Uh, sampling technique. Uh, does it affect our analysis? Yeah, definitely it will affect. Uh, not only our analysis, uh, the interpretation, the generalization. If we are not uh, taking sample in uh, uh, a serious way, that sample may not be representative. When you are making analysis, uh, we could start to infer about the population that we have been talking about. That is. Uh, the target population. For example, let's say uh, uh, the effect of turnover in a certain college. Then I may I may, I may put uh, ten individuals haphazardly without taking this sampling uh, techniques seriously. Then after analysis, if I try to generalize about 
then someone who is reading my research will raise very important question, how did you reach these 10 individuals? I have to show them clearly. I have to show the reader clearly. If it was representative, nothing will happen. No effect will be uh, appeared to my analysis. But if it is not properly managed, the sampling technique, uh, especially I am using the probability sampling technique. I cannot generalize. I mean, uh, non-probability sampling technique. I cannot generalize about the population. If you want to generalize, you have to take, everyone has to be represented, or the selection has to be taken based on the probability. If you are not uh, using probability, then some sort of discrimination was there then that will tell us something about the business of the researcher. You, may could, you could pick someone because he is near to you. You could pick someone because uh, approaching him is convenient to you. That does not mean representation. So if you want to infer about the entire population, it is better to focus on probability sampling, but uh, still you can use non-probability sampling. Especially if you want to conduct uh, a research which is qualitative in nature, what matters is your argumentative writing. Then you are not talking about somebody else, you are talking about you, your analysis will be confined to that area. Then if someone wants to repeat it, another study has to be conducted again somewhere else because we don't assume that sample was taken in a representative way. I'm not sure if I address your question, Amin. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Any question? If uh, questions are there, I can address. If not, the floor will be given to our organizers. Thank you, sir. Now I request our coordinator, Dr. H. V. Somaji, to speak a few words. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, guest speaker of the day, Mr. Amara Abawa. Yes. Thank you very much. You yeah, have uh, presented the session in a very simple but very effective way. Thank you very much for the same on behalf of all our faculty and students, our old students, and others who have been invited for the program. Our uh, second year, our old students and others have not been benefited by your talk to take up uh, minor research projects, major research projects, to write articles and see that they are published in the Twitter journal. And our second year, present second year students, their uh, mor morale must have boosted, self confidence must have been boosted so that they would take up project work in lieu of a particular subject in their uh, uh, second year. Thank you very much. Kind of you. Okay. I thank all faculty also for having arranged the program for the uh, students. Old student, present student, 
and uh, others thank you for patient listening thank you very much thank you sir you are a source of inspiration and guidance for all of us i thank all the wonderful faculty members for their support last but definitely not the least i thank all of you for taking part in the session thank you dear participants please fill the feedback form thank you one and all Thank mm-hmm. you.